Well, we just read a uh, passage from Revelation chapter 12. And in that passage we see an unseen war, an invisible warfare that was being fought in the heavens. And I don't know if you've ever thought of Christmas in that way. You know, there's lots of characters at Christmas that we look at. We look at Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and the wise men. Uh, now, did you mind just shutting that back door just for the heating in here? By the way, we do have some new heaters at the back, which will be installed tomorrow morning. So, so I'm sure you're excited about that as well. But, uh, but the thing to be really excited about is this invisible warfare. You know, we think about all those characters that I was just mentioning, the King Herod and and all those other characters, but a lot of times we forget that there's another, there was another character there behind the scenes fighting a battle. And we read about it here in Revelation chapter 12. The devil, this dragon, the, the, this great dragon that, that fought against this baby being born. And he was there fighting that battle, this invisible warfare. Now, sometimes it's nice to be able to connect the dots in the Bible. And that's sort of what we're going to try to do this morning. Last week, I preached about when Jesus started the church, uh, Jesus Christ, that confession that Peter made, and Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Christ, the Messiah, the one who all the prophecies were foretelling would come. And Peter said, You are the Christ, you are the Son of the living God, and Jesus said, Yes, thou art Peter, and upon this rock, upon that confession that you made, I will build my church. And then what did he say? and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We didn't look that very much at that last phrase last week, but think about that phrase. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. So in other words, there's a warfare. There's a battle. There's an invisible warfare going on that the church is going to be a part of, that you and I are a part of. The battle of the ages. And, you know, God has an eternal purpose and the Christmas story is part of that eternal purpose, part of that eternal battle, that invisible warfare that is very, very real. It's God versus Satan. It's the, the, the good that God is working against the evil that the devil is trying to work. And God's kingdom, and there's two things that characterize God's kingdom, which we'll see, hopefully, in this message, which is, Humility and servanthood. And even the Lord Jesus Christ showed that. But Satan's kingdom, there's two things that characterize it, which is the opposite, which is pride and dominion, trying to take dominion away from God. And so those two things pitted against each other, those two kingdoms, God and Satan, uh, and, and Satan has a purpose, which we'll see, but God has a purpose as well. God's purpose, this eternal purpose that he had, was uh, in Christ to put a man at his right hand to share that throne and to rule the new heavens and the new earth one day. The God-man, Jesus Christ. That was his eternal purpose. The Bible tells us about that. We're going to look at that here in Ephesians in a little bit. But we are part of this battle. We are part of this battle. We'll come back to Revelation in a minute. But turn with me to the book of Ephesians, and I want you to see that this is a very real battle that is still going on, not just in the past. So the book of Ephesians, the little letter there that Paul wrote, the last chapter, chapter 6, and look at verse 11. It says, put on the whole armor of God. Now, Randall preached a message, a series of messages on this in recent days, so we don't have time to go through all of the armor of God. There was a man who wrote uh, a 1,200-page book, one of the Puritans, uh, about the armor of God. 1,200 pages, two columns, very fine print. You know, And, and he wrote, uh, yeah, that's probably the, the biggest book on the armor of God. So We don't have time to look at all that today, but I want you to see this. We put on the whole armor of God that he may be able to stand against the wiles. He's very wily. He has many devices. The wiles of who? The devil. Look at verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. 
So, this goes against the trend of modern Christianity. Modern Christianity likes to say, well, whenever you trust Christ when you're converted to, to Him, then all your trouble and uh, strife will be over and you'll, be, you'll, you, you'll have a perfect, peaceful life. But this verse says, we are wrestling. <laughs> We're in a fight. Uh, you know, but many Christians, they, they don't even think about, that there being, about there being any warfare at all. But it says we wrestle. That word wrestle is talking about in those days, it was hand-to-hand -hand struggle. Uh, it was real, it was heated, it was intense, and it often was to the death in those days. And it says we wrestle, not against flesh and blood. So not against people, we, or your enemy's not any people. You're not wrestling against the things in this world um, that we see, but we're wrestling against principalities. Now this is talking about the evil forces that we're wrestling against. Principalities, this is talking about their rank and their power. Uh, you know, and that the, 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 the demons are, are divided into different principalities, different ranks and different powers. They're also divided in, they're in high places against the spiritual wickedness in high places. Uh, powers against rulers of the darkness. And so they're in high places. They're, that's where they, they live. They're this, this army of wicked spirits fighting as we speak in this world. And it says against rulers. Some of them have very high power and very high position. Wickedness. You know, just think about the, the nature of the enemy. There's this great wickedness. And it says, uh, Wherefore, Verse 13, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may, may, be, may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand. You know, we're all going to face an evil day at some point in our lives as Christians. We live in an evil day, perilous times. It's, it's not really talking there about uh, when life is over, but it's talking about the troubles and the trials that you'll face. You need to be able to withstand in the evil day. One day you'll be in heaven and the fight will be over. So we need to do our best to fight while, we, while we're here, while God's left us here uh, to fight. And so we're not fighting against what we see, but against these forces in the unseen world where these mo the real movers and shakers are acting. The movers and shakers behind governments, behind kings, these, rule these are the rulers of this wicked world. And uh, this might be a new concept, these, these characteristics of God's kingdom and Satan's kingdom, this warfare. Maybe it's a new concept to you. Maybe you've never thought about Christmas in this way as being part of this. But God has this eternal purpose. And let's look at what it is. We're still in Ephesians. Look at chapter 3. Chapter 3 of Ephesians, verse 9. This is what God's purpose was all along. And the devil hates this. This is why he's so mad. Ephesians 3, verses 9 to 11. It says, um, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which He purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So God has an eternal purpose, it says in verse 11. He wanted, it involved a man, it involved placing a man on the throne at the Father's right hand to rule. Who's this man going to be? And uh, so God created man with that eternal purpose in mind. And the devil did not like that. Uh, if, you, if you look at chapter 1 as well, chapter 1 of Ephesians, this is what God wanted to do, His eternal purpose. Uh, verse 19, chapter 1, verse 19, it says, And what is the exceeding greatness of His power to usward who believe, according to the working of His mighty power, which He wrought in Christ, when He raised Him from the dead, and set Him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, 
far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. So Jesus gets to be above all the other angels. He's not an angel. He gets to, he's, a, he's a man. He's the God-man. He's God the Son. So God's eternal purpose was to put him above all the angels. Now why do you think that would have made the devil mad? Who was Lucifer? Before he was Satan, he was called Lucifer. Who was he? He was, the, he was an angel. He was the morning star. He was the highest angel. He was, he was in charge of, of administration of all the other angels. He was an archangel. And, uh, and he, he, the Bible talks a lot about him. It talks about uh, the fall of Lucifer. So Lucifer is a created being. Let's look at uh, Ezekiel. If, you, if you've never looked at this verse before, it'll really be an eye-opener to you. If you don't know where Ezekiel is, you can just listen as I read it. But please make sure you... Because there's some real clues here about who he is. And this is the origin of sin in the universe. Ezekiel 28, I don't think I've told you the chapter yet, Ezekiel 28, verse uh, 12. Ezekiel 28, verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. So this is talking, he's talking to the king of Tyre, and the king of Tyre had somebody behind him influencing him. So I, as I said, the demons influence kings. And the devil was influencing this man, the king of Tyre. And then he says, the person behind him, he was full of wisdom, he was perfect in beauty. This is talking about the devil. Look at verse 13. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. So the devil was in Eden, wasn't he? Tempting uh, Adam and Eve. And then he goes on to talk about all the beauty of him in verse 13. All the emeralds and, and the beauty of his, maybe of his wings and of his what he looked like. It talks about his pipes in verse 13. So maybe he was in charge of music in heaven and uh, the worship of God as well. And uh, it says, verse 14, oh, the end of verse 13, look at those words. In the day that thou wast created. So the devil, he wants to be like God, but he's just a created being. Thou wast created. Verse 14, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. It says in verse 15, Thou wast perfect. God created, just as He created man perfectly, He created the devil, and He was perfect. It says, Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till... That was very important. This is the turning point of the universe when sin entered the universe. Till iniquity was found in thee. That was the first sin. <clears throat> and then uh, he goes on to say in verse 17, Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. So Jesus, this is, the, this is the, the start of the fall. Now look at Isaiah. It's a little bit backwards in the Bible. Isaiah 14. <clears throat> Isaiah 14. These are the two passages that we learn about Lucifer's fall. Isaiah 14, verse 12. Thou, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? See, that's his, that was his title. How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon, also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend up above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. <clears throat> Verse 15, thou, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. So here we see Satan... The prince of this world system, he's the real unseen ruler of 
all these world powers that Isaiah has been talking about here. And, you know, he said it's going to be these world powers, Tyre, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome. But he says behind all of that is this, this verse that says, How art thou fallen, O Lucifer? And this tremendous passage, again, marks the beginning of sin in the universe with these five I wills that Satan gave. And uh, now a lot of people get this mixed up as where it fits in to the timeline. Some people think that, Jesus, that Satan fell before man was created, before the world was created. But I believe that he fell just after God created Adam and Eve. And that's when this happened. Because in Ezekiel it says, before the fall, thou hast been in the garden, in Eden, the garden of God. So I believe that this ha that's, I believe that's where it fits in. So that that helps you to connect the dots in your mind, doesn't it? That Satan was mad about human beings because he was he was the top angel. He was the archangel, you know. And here's God creating a, a new world, populating this new world with this race of creatures he made in His image, and now God's wanting the the angels to be ministers to man. And you remember, we learn in uh, Psalm 8 that man was created a little lower than the angels. So here's Satan, and God's wanting him to minister and, and, and take care of human beings, puny human beings, made from the dust of the ground. How, how, you know, his rage, you know, he rose up with anger. Instead of finding joy in serving God by ministering to others, being a servant, being humble. He's not like that at all. He, uh, he, he doesn't want to serve us. He wants to rule us. And so that's when his pride lifted him up. I will ascend. And so uh, he tries to, to, to get a rebellion against God. And in Revelation, it said in the passage that Rob said, it said a third of the stars went with him, or a third of the angels. But he, he lost, he didn't, his rebellion didn't work. Only a third of the angels followed Satan, and they were cast down, they fell. Now, uh, just think about um, that, that battle and how Lucifer uh, lost it. He was cursed. He was uh, brought to the ground. Um, the Bible tells us in Hebrews 1 that one day, instead of being a little lower than the angels, we're going to be lifted up higher than the angels. In Hebrews chapter 1. I don't have time to read all these proof texts today because I'm kind of giving you the whole sweep of the Bible and connecting the dots right now from Genesis to Revelation. So, but, uh, but in Hebrews 1, say, it says that, uh, that Jesus Christ is now higher than all the angels and he brings us to that position through his blood that he shed. And, but um, that, was, that was a test. I believe that that was the test for the angels. Remember, God gave human beings a test. But for the angels, God gave them a test as well. And the test was, will you obey me? Will you serve me? Will you be ministers to these human beings? And Satan failed that test. And he started questioning God. He started to rebel. It wounded his pride. It was beneath his dignity to do that. So he started questioning God. And he reasoned in his prideful wisdom that if he could, if he could show that God lacked wisdom to get that eternal purpose of getting a, a, a man, exalting a man to, to the throne, that he would show God can't, uh, he could show God's purposes stopped. He could show God has limitations and that he was going to try to take over after that. So you can connect the dots and see that was Satan's motive. And so he's planning it. He de he. he Dem tries to demonstrate to the, the, the third of the angels that he's gotten to follow him, that he could outwit God, and so he gets cast to the ground. And then you see him there in the Garden of Eden <clears throat> after that fall as the serpent coming into... He was supposed to be in that garden to serve as an angel, but instead he's there to tempt them. He's, he's fallen at this point. And so when, by that point, you get to uh, Genesis chapter 3. If he could, uh, he's trying to put God in a box in Genesis chapter 3. So he discovered that God had given, had also given man a test, a probationary period here. And he thinks, 
if I can get man to break that, if I can get them to sin, then they will die, and he'll never be able to put one of his, one of these men on the throne of over the angels. And then I'll show that God couldn't win, and I'll take over. And if he, but if he doesn't, if I can get man to sin, and God doesn't destroy man like He said He would, then I can say God is not really just. God is not really holy. He did. He just let those people live. And so that was Satan's strategy. He was trying to put God into a box here, but you can't put God in a box. So Satan comes in in Genesis 3, verse 14, and he tempts them, he gets them to sin, as you know, and so God curses the serpent. And he said, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle. So here's Satan, he gets his plan done, he gets man to sin, it seems like Satan's winning. He's destroyed man. Now man's going to have to die, experience death. Uh, but then God comes in and he curses Satan. He says, he, he, this is, this is uh, the ultimate part of his fall. It says, uh, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle. So why did Satan fall? Why does, was Satan cursed? Because thou hast done this. And it says, uh, Thou art cursed. And it says, Upon thy belly thou shalt go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. That's pretty low fall, isn't it? From the highest created being in the universe, above all the other created beings, above all the other angels, to slithering on your belly in the dust. And I know that's... Uh, uh, I, know that, that, I know that the devil is a spiritual being, but the metaphor here is you are now the lowest creature of the low. You're going to slither lower than a worm in the dust. And so that's just how far he's fallen. Uh, as, as we read in Isaiah 14, How art thou fallen from heaven, O those for thou art cut to the ground. And so, but, uh, so, but Satan still probably is thinking, Well, he can't curse me. I've got him. I can say, I can accuse these people now. You have to kill them and you'll never get your plan done to put a man on the throne. But then look at the next verse. Genesis 3.15 And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. And so Jesus is... Uh, the deceiver has been deceived. So God announces here in this verse for the first time that there's going to be a seed of the woman. The virgin birth. There's going to be a virgin birth. Usually in the seed of the man. We all know biology and that type of thing. But he says there's going to be one person who's going to be the seed of a woman. A virgin birth. He's going to crush your head. And he is still going to take over. He's going to be sinless. He, he will be able to sit on that throne. He's going to conquer death. And he's going to reverse this curse. And so Satan is uh, beaten. Satan didn't see this, I'm sure, coming. But so he's going to start fighting. He's going to try to still dethrone God by trying to destroy the bloodline through whom that special man was going to come. That's what the devil started doing. He's trying to destroy the bloodline. And all throughout the Old Testament, we could preach 50 sermons about that, about how Satan... All through the Old Testament, it was trying to destroy the bloodline of the Jews and trying to get them into Eden, trying to destroy them. When it got to Josiah, that 11-year-old king, he tried to kill him and, and so many others. And he was, But he was unsuccessful in destroying Israel. Where does that anti-Semitism that, that keeps popping up all through history, the hatred of the Jews, the irrational hatred of the Jews, where does that come from? It comes from the devil. Over and over he's tried to destroy them. And in Jesus Christ's birth, he tried to destroy him. He tried to get Herod to kill all the babies. Uh, just as he tried to get Pot, uh, Pharaoh years before to kill all the babies in Egypt, he tries to get Herod to kill all the babies in Bethlehem. And, of course, God, we're going to talk about it on Wednesday night, but God uh, has a plan and he, he escapes. And then, of course, he tries, to get, uh, he tries to destroy Jesus by tempting him in the wilderness, just like he tried to tempt Adam in the Garden of Eden. But he failed again. He tried to keep Jesus in the tomb. He failed again. And Jesus, he, he, he couldn't stop it. And so in Jesus' birth and his life and his death, Jesus uh, won and Satan failed. 
But Satan is still assaulting, he's still fighting, and he's fighting against God's people, even after Christ has been raised from the dead and seated at the Father's right hand, seated on the throne that was God's eternal purpose. And Satan's attacking. So what's he doing now? What's, how's he attacking now? Well, Satan attacks in God's will, in God's, with God's permissive will. He allows Satan to attack, and he's trying to prove, uh, Satan's trying to prove something. Satan can't do anything about what Jesus has already done, but if Satan can get one person who, who is one of God's children to go back and to, for, God, for God to be able to lose, just if, if God just lost one, then Satan would say, see, God's not reliable, and he'd say, I should take his place and sit on the throne. So that's what he's trying to He's trying to attack Christians, God's people, to say, they're not really serving you, they're not really your children. He's, that's why he attacks us. That's why he attacked Job. If you think, remember the book of Job, uh, the devil uh, came in. The Bible says in Job chapter 1, verse 6, Now there was a day when the sons of God, talking about the, the spirits, the angels, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And so it, from that verse we learn that there's, there are appointed times when all the angels, both good and bad, they have to appear before the Lord to give an account for what they've been up to, to be accountable for their actions. And Satan is even required to attend these sessions, and he has to report to the Lord. Verse 7 says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence camest thou? It's then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. That's what the devil's doing. The, Peter tells us what, what exactly he's doing, walking up and down the earth. He says, Be sober, be vigilant for your adversary, the devil. As a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. So the devil's doing two things. He's trying to devour as many people from going to heaven and take them to hell as possible. And the people he can't do anything about, who are saved and sealed and, and, and uh, justified by Jesus' blood, he's trying to get just one of them to see if, if God's, uh, God's going to lose this battle. If he just got one, God would lose the bat. But thankfully, God cannot, Satan can't get anybody who's been saved. You know, there's whole denominations who say you can fall away from the faith and you can lose your salvation, but even if just one person did that, the whole battle would be lost. And Satan would say, God can't keep and, keep and give you everlasting life. So Satan uh, desires to attack people, get, the, get them to curse God, but... Uh, He's attacking you. There might be a, a right now. There might be a meeting up in heaven with the angels. We don't know, but there might be a meeting right now. They might say, God might say, "Have you considered my servant James?" You know, and uh, the devil might say, "The only reason James serves you is because he gets stuff from you, and plus you put a hedge of protection around him, and I can't get to him. If if you let me get to him, he would curse you, and, I, and you would lose him. He would be one of mine again." And God would say, no, I, 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 I've, sa I've saved him, I've sealed him, he's mine, he'll never curse me. And the, uh, so maybe God would have then set the per perimeters for this. You can't go this far. But he would allow him and, and as a test to show that the devil's going to lose every time. So may we all be ready for that. The devil attacks. The devil attacks uh, believers. He attacks, he tries to devour unbelievers. He tries to devour us, but he can't. But he also attacks on our prayer life. Um, we don't have time to go into too much, but turn to Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10. This is another old, uh, one of the major prophets. Daniel chapter 10. The devil attacks and delays our prayers. So De Satan and his demons, they're constantly at work. And sometimes it's through national leaders and governments. And look at Daniel chapter 10, verse uh, 2 and 3. It says, In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. Now remember, three full weeks, okay? Uh, I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Again, remember, Daniel's been praying three weeks for something. And he's trying to understand the future uh, so he can write it down in the book of Daniel. <laughs> but... Uh, He's been praying for God's people in chapter 9, and, and then he gets the answer 
to his prayer. In verses 4 to 11, God sends a powerful angel to answer the prayer and to bring Daniel the message. But then in verse 12, the angel finally gets there. It says, Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. He says, from the very first day you started praying, your, your prayer was heard the first time. But, verse 13, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. How long was Daniel praying? Three weeks. How, and how long was the angel trying to get there? Three weeks, twenty-one days. The prince uh, uh, of the kingdom of Persia. Uh, so who's this prince of Persia? He's not the king of Persia, but he's the demon who's behind and influencing the king of Persia. And you know the Bible always says that whenever nations give themselves over to idols, that the demons are said to rule those nations. So these idols, you know, we have idols as well. We have idols of prosperity and pleasure in our land. And we have, the, you know, we've given ourselves those idols. And I'm sure that there's demons influencing our leaders. If, if you have unsaved idolatrous earthly kings they're very easily ruled by these demons with this great rank and authority and that's why they the rulers have such a hard time fixing the earth's problems because the demons are trying to keep them from fixing them so they can stay in charge so uh the message wasn't getting through because this angel had to call in another angel who outranked him and the prince of persia look at what he says he says in verse 12 uh, verse 13 but lo michael one of the chief princes came to help me. And I remained there with the kings of Persia. So Michael is an archangel. It says that in Jude verse 9. Michael the archangel. And uh, he came and, and helped him get through. So verse 20 says, um, Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grisha shall come. So remember, Persia was in charge, and then Greece with Alexander the Great came next. So he said that the prince of Greece, the demon behind Greece, is coming next. So, but remember that God's really in charge of history. No, none of the, no power, no human power or demonic power can ever get him off the throne. God's really in charge. Amen. So these, but I, what I wanted you to see here is that there are there are uh, demons that have different positions. And, you know, we, we should remember that we should be praying. The Bible says that uh, Paul was trying to get somewhere. He says, Satan hath hindered me. Satan can hinder us. Um, the Bible says in that list of armor of God, it says at the end of it, which Randall's preached before, at the end of it in verse 18 of Ephesians 6, it says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance, and supplication for all saints. Perseverance. It says pray. That's what part of the armor would pray with perseverance. Daniel prayed for 21 days. But isn't that encouraging to know that from the first day he prayed, the answer was on the way. And so that encourages us. The, we might be in the middle of it. We might seem like it, the, the heavens are brass and our prayers aren't getting anywhere. But God has heard us and the answer is on the way. So don't give up. Pray with perseverance and supplication, it says. Um, you know, if you give up, if you turn your back and you stop trusting God, there's no armor for the back. Uh, in that list of the armor of God, there's no armor for your back. So, so stand firm, fight the good fight of faith. And so Satan is still fighting. He's still fighting our prayers. He's still fighting us. He's still fighting to devour people. But the ultimate fight is what we saw in Revelation 12. And so just turn their back as we finish. <coughs> Revelation 12, the ultimate fight was the fight to try to keep from Christ being promoted to the throne and Satan being demoted. He didn't want to stay demoted and he, because he was trying to stop Christ from being promoted. And so at Christmas time, we're going to talk a lot about Jesus coming. Jesus' coming as, was not of small significance. Jesus' coming was so important for all the prophecies to be fulfilled. And, and here in Revelation 12, it says there was a great wonder in heaven. Uh, in verse 1 and 2, it says, There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Who is this? 
This woman is the nation of Israel. Twelve stars, remember twelve tribes in Israel. And it says, And she being with child cried, travailing in birth, and pains to be delivered. So this, there's this picture of a woman in labor trying to bring a child to the world. Who brought Jesus into the world? Israel. Jesus was a, became of the tribe of Israel. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. You know, they've been waiting for so long for him ever since Genesis 3.15. And so her child, Israel's child, ultimate child, would be Jesus. He would be Satan's nemesis, Christ himself, the hero of this whole end times drama in the book of Revelation. But we not only see a great wonder, we see a great dragon. It says in verse 3, And there appeared unto another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. Remember, a third of the angels followed him. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. This is, he, it says here that he, he did cast them to the earth, this downward path. The, the devil, ever since that sin, sin always takes you down. It never takes you up. He was at the top. He got cast down. Down. He's, he's on a downward path all the way to the bottomless pit and to the lake of fire. Hell was created for the devil and his angels. Not for you, but the devil wants you to go there. That's his whole plan. So, um, look at what it says here. The great dragon. Um, the number seven there is... Uh, you know, the number of completeness. And we see there his power. He's intelligent. He's cunning. He's scheming. He's got seven crowns. Um, in other words, or seven heads uh, as well. And so these, these crowns tell us that he was in charge. He was the, he's the prince of this world. He's the prince of the power of the air, the Bible says in Ephesians 2.2. 2. He's over all the other demons. He's the prince over royalty, over men as well. He influences them, so he's got power. He's got partners. Look at verse 4. He drew the third of the stars in heaven. So those stars represent angels. He didn't come to this earth alone. He's got all sorts of fallen beings. We don't know how many that is. It's just a third of them. You know, um, uh, There's probably thousands and thousands. But uh, Matthew, Matthew 25, 41, it says... Jesus said to some demons, he said, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So his, his angels are not good. They're filled with all the same hatred for God and his people that Peter has. Uh, then we see Satan's purpose in verse 4. It says, what did he want to do? He wanted to devour her child as soon as it was born. So he, is, he tried to get Pharaoh to kill all the babies. He tried to get Herod to kill all the babies. He's trying to destroy them. And this is the end of this long campaign. Uh, and he finally saw that baby that was born nailed to a cross. And his body was wrapped in linen and spices and sealed in this stone-cold tomb. And Satan thought he'd won. But then we see he didn't win. Look at what it says. In uh, verse 5, we see the child. And she brought forth a man-child. That's Jesus, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. So, as we saw, Jesus did die, and yet he rose again. Jesus, Satan could not keep him in that tomb, and he was caught up to heaven. And he broke through the bars of the gates of hell. And uh, he led captivity captive, the Bible said. And so he took them. He, he took all those Old Testament saints to heaven. And there was a war in heaven after that. When Jesus sat on the throne after he, he died, he was buried. He broke through. He preached good news to the people who were waiting for him all those years. He broke through the gates of hell. He rose again. He ascended back to heaven. Where did he do then? He sat on the throne. And... When he sat on that throne, there was another war in heaven, verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon 
was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them day and night, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. So, and by, uh, and they loved not their lives unto death, it says there. So, he was cast out when, the, uh, when Christ, the man child, was seated on his throne. That happened when Christ ascended. And that had a profound effect on heaven's occupants. Remember, there were people in heaven from the Old Testament who, before Jesus had died. And so I'm sure that the devil was up there all the time saying, these people don't belong here. He's called here the accuser of the brethren. He, before that, before Jesus ascended, it says he accused them before our God day and night. These people don't belong here. There's been no sacrifice for them yet. The blood of bulls and goats don't take, doesn't, doesn't take care of them. There's been, never been anybody died for them. And there's no mediator for them. There's no reason why they should be here. Remember, it's like a legal scene up in heaven. And Jesus, Satan's the accuser. But now Jesus is up there. He is the mediator. He's sat down there. And now it says here in verse 12, Rejoice. Oh, therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the seal and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Jesus, the devil has just a short time now. And of course, it's all going to climax when he tries to take over the world. And that's what Revelations is all about. And yet, Jesus, he's still going to lose that battle as well. But, but what, what is he trying to do now? He's still trying to accuse us here on the earth, trying to get one of us to be lost. But he, he won't be able to, to get anybody to be lost. The Bible says now he is, he is there. Uh, and I'll finish with Romans 8. Verse 33. The devil can't get any of us. If he could, he'd win the battle. But it says in Romans 8.33, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Uh, I wasn't going to read to the end, but it's exciting. Let's read it. Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, that for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep to the slaughter. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able separate us from the love of God which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So the war is really over. Satan failed to dethrone God in the Garden of Eden. Satan failed throughout the whole Old Testament era. Satan failed to destroy the man-child Jesus at his birth. Satan failed to get the man-child to sin as he tempted him in the wilderness. Satan failed to keep him sealed in the grave. And so now Jesus Christ. He has the position of administrator that Satan used to have, but he's so much greater than Satan ever was or ever could be. And he's gone through the valley. He's made the way. He's risen above Satan. He's seated on the throne. And he can bring us, he can rise us, raise us up to heaven as well, so that one day you can be in that position. Not because we deserve it, but because Christ made the way. And uh, he's, he, he's still fighting, though. The devil's not thrown in the towel yet. He's not acknowledged his defeat. He's still attacking us. May we be faithful. And may this, I hope this sermon, hope we can stand firm, hope we can put on the whole armor of God and fight the battle. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the message of Christmas, which is the part of your eternal purpose. Thank you for sending your Son to die for us, for shedding that blood on that cross that that uh, won the victory for us. Father, we, we pray that we can as Christians stand firm and put on the whole armor of God. We pray that we'll be able to comprehend what is the breadth and length and depth and height 
and to know the, lo the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you so much for Christ uh, who gave his life for us. I pray if there's anyone here who's not saved, help them not to be devoured by Satan and taken to a lake of fire. Help them to put their faith and win the victory that Jesus has already, and get the victory that Jesus has already won, the forgiveness of sins and a home in heaven by simply putting their faith in what Jesus did for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.